Troubled times. Without debate, we live in very troubled times. The nation in which we live continues to slide down the slippery slope of immorality as the moral fabric of our nation is unraveling. Not only that, but the value of the U.S. dollar continues to decrease our economy. It continues to suffer. At the same time, Russia continues to regain its position as a world superpower. And the U.N. continues to put pressure on Israel to divide up the boundaries of their land in order to achieve the ever-elusive two-state solution. Furthermore, the Christian church, it continues to slip into a state of apostasy as heretical preachers are now hailed as heroes of the faith. When it comes to the typical church service here in America, emotional experiences have replaced the exposition of God's word. Style has replaced substance. Hypnotic hype has replaced humble worship. Projection screens are beginning to replace real pastors as more and more churchgoers gather around the cults of personalities that spring up through this land. If you're paying attention to what's going on in the world today, then the chances are you're, like me, growing concerned about the downward spiral that we find ourselves in. And if you recognize the growing apostasy, which is gaining ground even within the church, then I'm going to guess that you're a little stressed out about the state of things. Now, if this sounds like you, then it's my hope that this New Year's prophecy update will comfort your heart. Because listen, there's great comfort for those who know that the end of times is actually at hand. Now, in order to explain what I mean by that, in order to grasp how the end of times should bring us great comfort, I'd like you to open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, because there we find Paul. He's actually comforting the Christians at the church in Thessalonica by focusing on the events of the last days. As you make your way to 1 Thessalonians 4, I want to remind you that the Lord Jesus, he not only promised his disciples that he was going away to prepare a place for them, but in so doing, he also promised them that he would send a holy helper who would come and dwell within every believer. As a matter of fact, in John's gospel, we find Jesus, he's comforting his disciples about his departure. And he comforts them by declaring, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Now as we consider this prayer, it's important for us to understand here that the Greek word that Jesus used when he referred to the spirit of truth as the helper, this word can also be translated comforter. If you're reading a King Jimmy Bible, then in your Bible it says comforter rather than helper. And so Jesus is saying, I'm going to pray to the Father, and he's going to send another comforter. He's going to send the spirit of truth who will come and comfort us. And so the, the idea that, oh man, Jesus is going away, he's, he's not going to be here for a while, that bums me out. Jesus is saying, no, don't worry. I'm sending another comforter, and he's going to comfort you while I'm gone. As we consider the meaning of this word, it's important to understand that the Holy Spirit has not only been sent to help us to walk in the holiness of God, but he was also sent to comfort us with the assurance of our salvation until the day that we find ourselves together with our Savior, Jesus. Listen, I believe that the Holy Spirit was not only sent to comfort every believer from within, but I also believe that he wants to help us to comfort one another here within the church. According to Paul, this ministry of comforting one another, it's an important feature, and it ought to be a function of every Christian here in the end times church. In order to prove my point, let's begin to dig into our text tonight. If you would look with me there at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I want to begin reading at verse 13 because there Paul declares, 
I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now, I want to stop right here because when Paul tells us that he doesn't want us to be ignorant of something, he's saying, hey, Christian, hey, church, I don't want you to be uninformed about this topic. The rest of the world, they're going to be ignorant about this. We as believers should not be. We shouldn't be ignorant about what he's talking about here. And the topic at, at hand, it's concerning those Christians who had already fallen asleep, or, or that's a nice way of referring to those who had died. There were believers who had died, and I'm guessing that, that because Jesus had gone and, and they were expecting to come back any minute, that they're beginning to wonder, well, what happens to them? Did they miss the kingdom? Are they going to miss out on the return of Christ? They probably had a lot of questions about what happens to those people who have already died and yet they trusted in Jesus. And so Paul's, Paul's basically saying, hey, what I'm about to tell you has everything to do with those believers who have already died. Chances are we know believers who have died and it grieves our hearts. And yet the Holy Spirit would want to comfort us and help us to understand that God has a greater plan. And beginning there at verse 14, Paul declares, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now here in these verses we find Paul, he's comforting the Christians there in the first century by helping them to understand that there would be a day when believers would be caught up into the air into the clouds. And there in that moment in time, the believers who are alive when this happens, they will be instantly reunited with the believers who had already fallen asleep. The believers who were living when this catching away happens, they'll be reunited with those who were already dead in Christ. I'm of course referring here to what's called the rapture of the church. Now, in order to understand this important doctrine, I want to take a closer look at the text, and we should begin by defining the key words there, caught up, which are found there in the middle of verse 17. You see, when Paul tells us here that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, he's using the Greek word harpazo, which was used to refer to something that is taken away and carried. There are many different ways to use this word, but one example is this. If you were standing on the edge of a pool and right below you was a small child who was struggling to swim, if you reach down and you grab that child and you pick them up by a little force and grab them out of that water and carry them away to safety, that would be one way to use this word. And that's how I kind of feel. I feel like I'm kind of drowning here in this world a little bit. And I'm kicking and screaming and I'm waiting for the Lord to just reach down and grab me and pull me up and get me out of this place. This is the rapture. I should also point out that while this Greek word was translated to our English words, caught up, the same Greek word was translated into the Latin verb rapimur in the Latin vulgate. It's from this Latin verb that we get our word rapture. Now there are those who say, the doctor, doctrine of the rapture. The word rapture is not found in the, church, in, in the Bible, therefore the doctrine doesn't belong in the church. Now if you ever hear a person argue that the word rapture isn't found anywhere in the Bible, you can assure them that the word rapture, it's the English rendering of the Latin equivalent of the Greek word harpazo, which is found right here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So the Bible most certainly teaches the doctrine of the rapture. And listen, the beautiful thing about Paul's promise here. It's, it's found here in a text, and it's this. The, the, the promise is that the rapture of the church will not only result in a reunion with the believers who have already died, but this rapture will also place us 
in a, in a, in a place where we're physically perfect and, and, and in the presence of our Savior. Notice again there in verse 16. There Paul tells us that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we should always be with the Lord. Here in these verses we learn that the Lord will descend from heaven, but this is not the second coming. He doesn't descend from heaven to the earth. It's kind of like uh, he meets us halfway type of thing. He descends from heaven or, or comes from wherever that is, and, and he meets us here in our atmosphere as we're caught up to meet him there in the clouds. And so this rapture is this moment when the believers who are alive on the planet, we are caught up off of this planet, we are pulled up off of this planet, and we meet the Lord in the air. And it's at this point in time when we will be changed and transformed into glorious beings. Now with this in mind, if you would hold your place here in 1 Thessalonians 4, and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You see, it's in 1 Corinthians 15 where we find Paul. He's writing more about that moment when the church will be caught up and then transformed into glorious beings who are able to stand in the presence of God. As we consider what Paul is saying here, I'd like to look there towards the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to look beginning there at verse 50. There at 1 Corinthians 15 verse 50, Paul declares this. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now here in these verses we learn that those who have placed their faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ were eventually going to be given this brand new body which will be incorruptible. Isn't that comforting to know? I mean, if, if you're younger, maybe you're just like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not doing so bad right now. But the older you get, the more you're looking forward to that new body. Seriously, I would be bummed out if I found out that I had to live in this body for the rest of eternity. I, I mean, I hurt myself sleeping. You know, I wake up in the morning with a, with a new pain that's just like, what happened? I was just laying there, and, and I'm so old now that I, that I hurt myself sleeping. The older we get, the more we long for that new body that we're going to receive on the day when we're caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds. And knowing that every Christian is going to spend the rest of eternity in, in, in a brand new body, or, or what I would call a perfect body. We're going to have a perfect body, we're going to be in a perfect place with our perfect Savior. It doesn't get any better than that. And Paul directed his audience to comfort one another with this truth of the rapture because it's at this point in time when we're raptured and when we're caught up and, and brought into the presence of God that we begin to experience this perfection. Now with this in mind, let's turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 because there Paul directs us to this very end. Look with me there at verse 18, because there Paul writes, therefore, again he's talking about the rapture, the catching away, therefore, because of this rapture, comfort one another with these words. Now this word comfort is translated from the, the verb form of the Greek word that Jesus used when he referred to the Holy Spirit as the comforter. So the Holy Spirit is the comforter, noun. We as Christians have been called to comfort, the verb form, one another. So while it's true that the comforter currently indwells every Christian here in the church age, it's also true that we've been called to comfort one another. And one of the best ways to do that is with the doctrine of the rapture. The doctrine of the rapture was designed to bring comfort to the heart of the Christian. And 
that's exactly what I hope to do here tonight. I hope to comfort you with this doctrine of the rapture. Like I pointed out during the introduction of this study, we definitely, definitely live in troublesome times. Most of us already know that things, it's not going to get better here in America. I know that we have hopes and, 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 and we want to make you know, political moves and we want to try to you know, bring our country back to a, a place of, 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 of morality and conservatism and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and would it be to God that we could actually do that? I'm, I'm all for it. I'm not suggesting we throw our hands up in the air and say all is lost and let's just you know, give up. That's not my point. But if I understand the scriptures correctly, I have to assume that things are going to get worse and worse and worse here in America. One reason why I say this is because our country is almost entirely missing from the end time prophecies that are found in the Bible. Why is that? America has been a superpower for quite some time now. How is it that a superpower like America is completely missing from the end time prophecies of the Bible? Well, think about it like this. We know that there's coming a day when there's going to be a global economy. So when, when the Bible tells us about the global economy and the, and, and the, the one world ruler that will be over that global economy, I, I read America into those prophecies. I think America is found within that, but we're nameless. We're nothing. You see, this, this global leader, he's going to come along and he's going to require every person in the world to receive his mark on their, or in their right hand or in their forehead in order to buy, sell, and trade, in order to conduct business. But what has to happen for that to actually take place? Well, before this can happen, I would imagine that economies have to kind of fail. And I would argue that the U.S. must first reach the point of complete economic disaster in order for there to be some sort of one world monetary system which is managed by this global ruler. We would have never thought that was possible years ago. But in order to show how close we are to this point in time, I only need to say three words. Debt ceiling crisis. How far are we from complete economic collapse here in our country? Not far. We're right on the edge of it. Clearly our country is on the verge of economic disaster. And once it happens, it probably won't be too long until North America becomes a third world continent which no longer has the power to influence world events. It's no wonder why we're not really found within the end time prophecies of the Bible. It's my guess that this is why our country is missing from these Bible prophecies. Now this might bring great fear to your heart as I talk about these things and you might be wondering, what happened to the comfort message? I thought this message was about comforting us. If that's what you're wondering, please allow me to comfort your soul by reminding you of something that Jesus said about these troublesome times. You see, it's in Luke 21, verse 20, 28, where Jesus declares this. He, he's talking about the end time events. He's talking about all the turmoil that's going to be happening. He's talking about troublesome times. And he says this, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. He doesn't say, look to Wall Street and hope for better days. He says, look up. Lift up your heads. Because the day of your redemption is close. If troublesome times of this world are causing you to stress out, if everything I'm talking about, the collapse of, 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 of American economics and, and, you know, becoming third world country and all this sort of thing, if, if this freaks you out, I encourage you, your focus is in the wrong place. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, look up. Get your focus straight. Lift up your head 
and look for the soon return of the Lord. Many people have asked me, which prophecies need to be fulfilled before the rapture can occur? And the answer is none. The, the rapture of the church could happen any minute. There are no prophecies that need to be fulfilled before the rapture occurs. Therefore, we must understand Jesus could catch us away at any minute. And it's in that very second that every believer will find themselves in a perfect body, in a perfect place, with a perfect Savior. Now, who's disappointed about that? Not me. I'm ready to go. The only thing that, that would cause me to say, Lord, not yet, is just simply because there's other people that I want to reach. There's other people that I want to lead to, to the grace of God. Other than that, I'm just like, let's go. Punch my ticket. Let's get out of here. I'm done. I'm ready to be in that perfect body. I'm ready to be in that perfect place with my perfect Savior, face to face, worshiping him in the way that he ought to be worshiped. It's with this that I hope to comfort you. I hope that you're comforted to know that as a Christian, we could be caught up any minute. That comforts me. I hope it comforts you. But listen, we should not only comfort one another with the doctrine of the rapture because it could happen any minute, but we should also comfort one another with the doctrine of the rapture because it provides us with a way of escaping what's about to come. With this in mind, let's continue to make our way through the book of 1 Thessalonians. If you would look with me there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. There Paul declares, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Now here in these verses, Paul assures his audience here that there was no need to write to the church about the times and the seasons of the sudden destruction that would come upon the earth. See, I don't, I don't need to write to you about these things because you're not going to be here, basically. The, the day of the Lord is not going to overtake the church like a thief in the night. And I should point out that the word overtake... Well, it comes from a Greek word which, in this context, it speaks of those who have been overpowered and apprehended. There's going to be some darkness in this world as the day of the Lord approaches. And it's going to overtake some. And they will not escape. But that's not true of us. That's not true of the church. And with this, Paul seems to be suggesting here that there's, there's going to be these times, there's going to be these seasons that overtake others, but not the church. Therefore, I would argue that this information, it's largely irrelevant to the church. And that's what Paul seems to be suggesting here. There's no need for me to write to you about these things, because it doesn't apply to you. Now, in order to understand who these times and seasons apply to, we should notice the hint that Paul presents here in our text. If you would notice with me there in verse 3, there Paul declares... For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Here in these verses, Paul was writing about another group that he refers to as they. When they say this, they shall not escape. Now who is this they? Well, he gives us a clue to their identity with the words peace and safety. And with this clue in mind, hold your place here in, in 1 Thessalonians 5 and turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. You see, it's in Daniel 9 where we find the angel Gabriel. He's showing up and presenting Daniel with a prophecy which was designed to help the nation of Israel to understand the times and the seasons that God appointed for them. Here in this prophecy, we not only learn that there's going to be a time when the promised Messiah would arrive, but we also learn that there would come also a world ruler a so-called prince who would usher in a time of pseudo-peace. And with this in mind, look with me there at Daniel 9, beginning at verse 24. 
There Gabriel declares, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolates. Now, there's a whole lot of information here in this prophecy that we have absolutely no time to dig into. And since we don't have all the time that we need to develop all of this, I would just encourage you, if you want to know more about this prophecy, go and listen to my exposition of this passage. It's found on our website. You can just go listen to it for free. I encourage you to do that. But to sum it all up, Gabriel was presenting Daniel with a mathematical formula for using what's translated here, weeks, but that's talking about Sabbath, Sabbath years or a seven-year period. The Jews had six years, and then the seventh year would be a Sabbath year. And so these are Sabbath years that he's talking about. This was a mathematical formula for using these Sabbath years in order to understand the times and the seasons which God had predetermined for the nation of Israel. And there in verses 26 and 27, Gabriel reveals that there was going to be a prince who would rise up and make a seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel, and that would be the final seven-year period of time. At that point in time, Israel... They truly believe that they're going to have this time of peace and safety. When this seven-year treaty is signed, they're going to they're enter into this peace treaty thinking that the Messiah had arrived and that they're going to enjoy these seven years of just peace and safety. Unfortunately for Israel, Gabriel also, Gabriel also reveals here that this covenant is going to be broken in the middle of those seven years. Therefore, this so-called Prince of Peace who brokers this peace treaty, he's nothing more than a deceiver and a false Christ. As a matter of fact, with this in mind, let's turn back to 1 Thessalonians 5, because there Paul presents us with a little more information about this prophecy. If you would notice with me there in 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning at verse 1, Paul writes, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in night. For when they say, and I believe that the they is the nation of Israel, when they say peace and safety and sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Now as we consider this prophecy about peace and safety, it's interesting to note that Paul also refers to this treaty of peace and safety or, or this time of, of peace and safety uh, along with the sudden destruction that comes upon them like labor pangs of a pregnant woman. Now that's interesting. He ties together the peace and the safety with labor pangs of a pregnant woman. And, and a pregnant woman doesn't begin to have those labor pangs uh, until the end of her third trimester. And as we know, this is roughly about nine months after conception. And so, we're, you know, if, if we're going to be literal about this, then we would be talking about a nine-month period of time. Now, I don't want to make too much of this because, you know, I, I try to interpret prophecy very, uh, very loosely in the sense that, you know what, this may be the way it is, maybe not. Maybe it's a literal nine months, maybe not, I don't know. So I don't want to make too much of this, but it's inter interesting to note here that our Secretary of State, John Kerry, met with Israeli and Palestinian negotiators last July in order to achieve Mideast peace or, 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 or a two-state solution there in the Middle East, and he wanted to accomplish this within nine months. 
That was the time frame that he determined. That within nine months, they wanted a peace treaty on the, the records. Then in August, both parties, uh, uh, the, the Israeli and the Palestinian parties, began to meet at an undisclosed location in Jerusalem. But why nine months? Why not six months? Why not 12 months? Why nine months? Why did Kerry determine nine months as the timeline for establishing what he says is a time of peace and safety? Well, it was the 16th of December, just a few weeks ago. Kerry announced that a peace deal by April 2014 is still possible. That would be the end of the nine months. August to April, nine months. He's saying, last December, that's still possible. Could this be the time that the birth pangs begin? Could this be the time that results in the, the Ezekiel War that culminates then in a, in a final peace treaty and whatnot? I don't know. I'm not setting dates. I'm just saying it's very interesting, nine months which comes up in April 2014. Another interesting tidbit about Kerry's timeline is based on the fact that the Jewish Passover is actually April 15th, 2014. So the Jewish Passover happens there in that same month that this nine-month period of time ends. And, and what's more interesting is that this Passover includes the ominous blood red moon. Again, I don't want to read too much into this because there are some nutty teachers out there who will take this whole blood red moon thing and just kind of run away with it and create all kinds of wackiness. But I will point out that there are very interesting connections between the nation of Israel and the four blood red moons that occur on a specific lunar cycle. For example, consider, there were four blood moons in the, year of, in the years of uh, 1493 and 1494, and that was the time when the Jews were expelled from Spain. The blood, red, the, the blood red moons occurred again in 1949 and 1950, right after the nation of Israel returned to their homeland for the first time in thousands of years. So as they entered back into their land, the four blood red moons happened again. Then in 1967 and 1968, the four blood moons happened with the Six-Day War which was a, a, a great battle and a great victory for the nation of Israel. Now, once again, there are four blood moons which will occur in 2014 and 2015. It's going to occur along with the feasts and the Passovers. You see, the, the Passover of 2014 and the Passover of 2015 will both have blood red moons. Not only that, but the Feast of Tabernacles of 2014 and 2015 will have blood red moons. Furthermore, it's also believed by some that the next year of Jubilee begins in September of 2015. And if this calculation is correct, then the fourth blood moon of, uh, there in 2015 will kick off the next year of Jubilee. If you don't know the significance of that, I encourage you to just go do a study on the year of Jubilee. But with all this being the case, if John Kerry is able to, to secure peace in the Middle East at the end of this nine-month period, then a peace treaty is going to occur with the first blood red moon on Passover of 2014, and that these four blood red moons will culminate with the 2015 Feast of Tabernacles blood red moon, which then kicks off Jubilee. Now that's extremely significant and very interesting, to say the least. Does this mean the rapture is about to happen? Does this mean the second coming is right around the corner? I don't know. But these events are incredible. The time period in which we live, it's incredible. And what God is about to do in light of all of this, I don't know. I'm guessing it's going to be incredible, though. Without debate, we are living in interesting times and seasons, and while it would be easy to get caught up into speculations and, and unanswerable questions, I'll remind you that according to Paul, there was actually no need for him to write to the Christians in Thessalonica about the times and the seasons. 
The reason why is because the sudden destruction that comes upon Israel, it won't affect the church. As a matter of fact, if you would notice again there in verse 4, there in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 4, Paul declares, but you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Christian, listen, the times and the seasons that are on the horizon of 2014 and 2015, they're ominous. It's not hard to imagine that the sudden destruction of the, of the war that's described in Ezekiel could literally begin in the next two years. And while the future looks dark, while it looks bleak, I, I want to comfort you by reminding you that the church will escape this sudden destruction that comes upon those who are rejecting the grace of God. The church escapes these times and seasons. Therefore, Paul didn't need to write to us about it, but rather encouraged us to simply comfort one another, knowing that we'll escape. And so we see then that Christians can take comfort in the doctrine of the rapture because it could happen any minute, and we can also take comfort in the doctrine of the rapture because it provides us with the way out. It provides us with that way of escape. But finally, I, I want to help you to understand that we can take comfort in the doctrine of the rapture because it shows that we're appointed to salvation and not to wrath. With this in mind, let's continue to make our way through the book of, of First Thessalonians here. If you would look with me there at chapter 5. I want to begin reading at verse 5. There Paul writes, You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also doing. Here in these verses, we find Paul, he's encouraging us to live in a way that would be pleasing to our Savior. We don't need to live our life in the darkness. We ought to be living in the light of Jesus Christ. And he not only encouraged believers to avoid drunkenness by living a life of sobriety, but he also encourages us to watch. He says, let us watch and be sober. He also tells us here, there in verse 8, to put on the breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now with that, I would just encourage you to go do a, a study on the armor of God. But as I consider these ideas of uh, this breastplate of faith, we need to guard our hearts with faith. And remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In these last days, we need to guard our hearts with the faith that comes from reading God's word. And we need to guard our hearts with the love that we find in the Lord. Not only that, but we need to guard our minds with the hope of salvation. We find it there at the end of verse 8. He says, as a helmet, the hope of salvation. You see, our minds can begin to worry about all of these things. It's possible that even right now some of you have tuned out of this study because you're freaking out about blood red moons and whatnot. Come on back. Put the hope of salvation as a helmet on your head. Guard your mind from all these worrisome thoughts by maintaining the hope of salvation. Wearing that hope like a helmet, guarding your mind from anything that would cause you to worry and stress out. I should point out that this word hope, it doesn't refer to a wishful desire. You might be thinking, hope of salvation. Yeah, I, I hope I escape all of this. 
That's not what the word hope refers. The, the word hope is not this wishful desire, like I, I hope it happens. No, it's, it, it's rather a joyful expectation. That's what the word hope means here. That we ought to have this helmet protecting our brains so that any worrisome thought that comes into our mind is instantly deflected by that helmet that says, no, I am joyfully expecting my salvation. The whole world is going to go through this time of tribulation that the Bible says people are going to cry out for the rocks to fall on top of them. Now, I don't know if you've ever stood you know, in front of a big boulder and thought, man, I, that would be better if that would just roll on top of me. But that's what the time of tribulation is described as, a time when people will want the very boulders uh, of mountains to just roll on top of them to escape the wrath of God. And you can be thinking, oh man, I, you know, I, I, I hope I don't have to go through all of that. But Paul says, no, you need to put on the helmet, which is the hope of salvation with a joyful expectation that we will be saved from all of this wrath. You see, Christians who are soberly waiting for the day of our salvation can know that we have been appointed to salvation, not wrath. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 9. There Paul declares, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. According to Paul, the Lord has appointed us, or in other words, the Lord has ordained us for salvation. Salvation from what? His wrath. He's going to pour his wrath out upon this planet during the time of the great tribulation. And Paul's saying you can have the hope of salvation in knowing that you were not appointed to that wrath, but rather you are appointed to salvation. What this means is that when the Lord decides to pour out his wrath upon this planet during that time of the great tribulation, we're not going to be here. We would have already been caught up to meet the Lord in the air. With that being the case, Paul tells us, comfort one another. With this in mind, look with me again there, verse 11. Paul declares, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are also doing. Here again, we find Paul using the verb form of that Greek word that Jesus used when he referred to the Holy Spirit as the comforter. And what this means is that the Holy Spirit, he's been sent not only to comfort us from within, but he's also been sent to guide us into how we ought to comfort one another during these troublesome times. Without debate, we live in troublesome times. And I truly believe things are just going to get worse, not better. Therefore, we need one another to comfort one another, to remind one another that we're appointed to salvation, that the rapture could happen any minute, that we don't have to worry about the future. If you see another believer stressing out about the economic disaster that's about to come upon America, don't let them just sit there and stress out about it and don't join in with it. Don't sit there, oh yeah, this is horrible. Now comfort one another. Remind one another about the rapture of the church and how we will be saved from the wrath of God. If you see another Christian upset about the moral decline that's occurring here in our country and, and it's just, you know, bummerville, don't just sit there and just grumble and don't sit there and get caught up in it. Comfort one another. Remind one another that it won't be long before the Lord catches us up off this planet and saves us from the sudden destruction that will come upon those who will not escape. Christian, listen, we've been called to comfort one another. We've been called to edify one another with the doctrine of the rapture. That's why I don't get those who... who, who Say, oh no, we're going to be here through the time of the tribulation. We're going to be, you know, broke because we, we're not going to take the mark and we're going to be living in caves and, you know, eating rocks and comfort one another with these words. It's not comforting at all. No, 
he's called us to comfort one another with the doctrine of the rapture. Because according to the doctrine of the rapture, we're not appointed to wrath. We're appointed to salvation. And I praise God for that. And I hope that that comforts you. But I'm here to tell you that if you have yet to place your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, there should be no comfort in your heart tonight. If you have yet to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, then right now, you are appointed to wrath. You see, he's only going to catch his church up into the air. And after that, there's going to still be people getting saved and, and turning to, to the Lord. And, and so praise God for his grace that people will be saved through the time of the tribulation. But why wait? Why live one more moment knowing that you were appointed to wrath when you could enter into a brand new life knowing that you were appointed to salvation? If you're here tonight and you have yet to trust in Jesus Christ, if you're here tonight and you have yet to receive the free gift of grace that the Lord is extending to you, I encourage you, trust in him. Allow him to be your savior. That way you can be comforted in, it, in knowing that you've been appointed unto salvation. Why not start 2014 as a brand new believer so that you can rest in the comfort of knowing that Jesus is your savior?